Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Pessel and Mrs. Dijkgraaf. As the director of the John Adams Institute, I'm very proud to welcome Marisha Pessel, our author for the evening, to Amsterdam. The John Adams Institute is very pleased to have you as a speaker at the Institute. Thank you for coming. I would like to compliment you with your book, Special Topics in Calamity Physics. Mrs. Marisha Pessel has written with this book one of the most talked about debuts of the year. It's already a bestseller in the US and she got amazing reviews in the US press. On September 28, Jonathan Franzen spoke at our institute and I can tell you he is mesmerized by you. And I'd like to mention here his quote on your book. Um, it's Beneath the foam of this exuberant debut is a dark, strong drink, and I can't agree more. Tonight's moderator is Margot Dijkgraaf. She's a journalist for NSA Hansblad and presenter of a book program for Dutch television AT5. Margot Dijkgraaf will start with the interview, and Marisha Pessel will read from her work as well. Questions from the audience are taken after the conversation. Thank you, and I hope you will enjoy this evening. Maybe you can s come to the stage. Thank you very much, Corine. It works. Yes, it works. Well, Marisha Pessel, I'm very honored to be uh, your interviewer tonight because the novel you have written, uh, Special Topics in Calamity Physics, is a, an extremely intelligent novel, I think, and it has already, already led to many comparisons with other recent young literary talents in the Anglophone world, Zadie Smith, uh, Jonathan Safran Foer, Nicole Krauss, Benjamin Kunkel, what does it do to you when you suddenly come with your first book and then you are immediately compared to the, the top? Uh, what does it do to you? It, of course, it's a great surprise. I certainly never thought ahead to anything beyond the publication. I was so entrenched in the day-to-day the -day aspects of writing that I never, it never occurred to me any sort of reception. I was simply happy to be published and have my small voice out there in some a small way. voice? Well, <laughs> small voice. Did you see the book she has written? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important and a very vibrant, flamboyant voice, as I would say. The novel is an intellectual mystery. It's set in, in North Carolina, private school. Just to be curious, how many of you did read, read already the novel written by Marie Chappelle? Wow. And how many of you are still reading it in the middle of it? Wow. Great. You see. Well, that, isn't that wonderful? It is, it is an engaging narrator. She is giving the floor, giving the word in this book, and the ending. Maybe you've not yet reached the ending, but it's a really sinister twist at the ending. The narrator is a 16-year-old brilliant student. It's a precocious adolescent, Blue Van Meer. Blue Van Meer. Van Meer. <laughs> is that a Dutch name? <laughs> Uh, well, Van Meer? <laughs> I actually, the, the root of my choosing Van Meer is nowhere near as glamorous as I would like to be, <laughs> as I would like it to be. I was actually working as a consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers for most of the time I was writing this book, and I was looking for a name, and I don't, I, I don't tend to think too deeply about names. I just simply react to them on a more of a gut level and an intuitive level because I've already worked with the characters. It's just a question of, of finding a name. And a name is a bit like a pair of shoes that your character is going to walk around in. You don't want it to be too practical and you don't want it to draw attention to itself, but it should still mean something and portray something about who, this, who the characters are. So I was trolling through the names uh, database of PricewaterhouseCoopers and I started with the A's <laughs> and eventually made my way all the way through, couldn't find it, and finally I reached the V's and all the Vons and the Vans and uh, found Van Meer and it seemed to fit. So. 
Well, well, yes, but why did it fit Van Meer? What is so special about the name well, that you thought, well, that's my name? Is oh, it Vermeer? Van Meer? Vermeer? Well, what the is the Dutch root of the word? Well, Meer means lake, actually. Oh. And Vermeer, of course, is the great Dutch uh, painter. Of course, yes. So, well, it has that grandiosity that fits Blue and Gareth, I think. So. The Blue and the Meer, they fit. The blue and the lake. Yes, and Gareth Van Meer, Blue Van Meer, they seem to just work on a musical level. <laughs> okay. Because you named already her father, Gareth, yes. uh, who is a professor. And Blue lives with her father. Who, and her father is one of the most fascinating uh, characters I have ever come across. Because, well, first of all, you fall in love with Gareth. Did you uh, fall in love with Gareth at the first time? Well, actually, not everyone loves him. I mean, he... he but in the beginning, oh, yes. He also elicits yes. a lot of hate as well. Um, but he is a character that I tend, as an author, not to pass any moral judgment on any of my characters. I let them be who they are, because even villains and uh, even heroes, they always react in a, a, in a way that they feel they are the voice of truth and they are right. And uh, so I reserve judgment. But, of course, the w he does... Uh, get a lot of face time in the book, so I certainly like him a little bit, yes. A little bit is not much for <laughs> such an important character in your book. No, of course I like him more than that. Because he's a lady killer, okay. He's a brilliant man. Yes. He is absolutely charismatic. He's extremely sympathetic. Yes, of course, when you've come to the end of your book, it's becoming a little bit more difficult. But still, he's an extremely interesting uh, character, I think. And then the two, the father and the daughter, they travel from college to college because Gareth is teaching every time for a short time in a different university. I think your narrator says she spent between six and 16 years, they, they lived in 39 cities in 24 schools. Yes. That is amazing. Yes. Why this extreme? Well, I initially started uh, the book with these two characters, this very brainy, shy, painfully shy, bookish narrator and her father, this larger-than-life charismatic professor. And I wanted, I knew I was going to write from a first person, and her itinerant existence, this, these 10 years that she travels, roams America with her father who works as a visiting lecturer, this went into her characterization because she has no relationships beyond that of her father and the hundreds of books that she reads because her father does devote a lot of his time to her education. So it's really through these books that she interprets the world and yeah. having, her, having this nomadic childhood for her allowed her to be isolated. So at the outset of the novel, she's, she is incredibly shy and antisocial and doesn't know how to connect with human beings, and she really yeah. only connects with books. So you really <coughs> thought that through. How yes. can I imagine a character who is only with a father? Yes. And that's why you kept her moving along and going from one school to another. Exactly. To that isolate her. her. Exactly. Ah. Wow. Great. And then finally, these father and the daughter, they settled down for a final high school year in St. Ge St. Galway, do I pronounce it? St. Galway. St. Galway, okay. It's a North Cor Carolina school, and there Blue, the daughter, meets a teacher, a very special teacher, Hannah Schneider. <laughs> yes, Hannah Isn't Schneider. Isn't that, uh, that's not a Dutch name. How did you choose that name? <laughs> It's actually, I, was, that was the name that I hated, and it was really just like a working title for a long time, and I knew, because Hannah Schneider is larger than life, and uh, uh, most of the characters I made up from scratch, but Hannah actually has an origin in a film noir, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, called Out of the Past. Oh. And uh, that particular character, that femme fatale named Kathy Moffat, is um, where I originally conceived this Hannah Schneider character. But Hannah Schneider, the name itself is quite prosaic, and I wanted to find something a bit more glamorous for her, but every time I tried to change it, the character, and I tend not to romanticize my characters, I don't talk about them having lives of their own that I can't control them, because I don't really agree with that, I think I can control them, but in this particular case, 
every time I tried to change the name, it just seemed to, it wasn't right. So I had to go back to Hannah Schneider again and again, and eventually I gave in. <laughs> so. Well, I think it's a fine name for such a beautiful, well, she was a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. She is, or she was. Mm -hmm. She's dead now, but she was a beautiful woman, wasn't she? Exactly. Yeah. And then this Hannah Schneider has got a very weird influence, not only on Blue, but also on her father, and mm -hmm. also on this small group of, well, I think we can say privileged students she is going to, to see in this last year of her high school. They meet each weekend, and they form a group, the Blue Bloods. The Blue Bloods. Blue Blood, is that something across? Aristocratis, aristocratic? Of course. Well, I was influenced in, a, particularly in American culture, there is always the so-called cool kids in every high school. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I, I mean, I'm reminded of that Woody Allen quotation at the beginning of Annie Hall. He's quoting Groucho Marx, and he says, I would never want to be uh, part of a club that would have someone like me as a member. And I always find that so true, is when you actually are in the in crowd, you so often want to be out again. So um, I was just You're playing never at, with the right, at the right place, actually. Exactly. Yeah. And I was playing with the idea of being an outsider. And of course, um, d dissecting a bit American uh, youth and teenagers themselves. And um, so they're, the Blue Bloods are my answer to that. OK. Then we learn a lot about these kids who form together the Blue Bloods. They, may, they meet each weekend. They f they, uh, we feel very quickly that there is something wrong with them. I mean, they're all beautiful, they're very successful, they're very intelligent, but something is wrong. And especially in the relationship of the Blue Bloods with um, Hannah Schneider, mm -hmm. there's something uh, very, well, there is something unhealthy, I would say in the real relationship. And then, and we are then at page 170, I think, in your novel, novel there is a man found dead in the uh, piscine of her house, of Hannah's house. And then they are there, they witness it, but they are not allowed to be there. And later on, there is an excursion with the six students, and then Hannah Schneider herself is being found dead. Is it suicide? Is it murder? And that's where uh, your novel, Special Topics in Calamity Physics, becomes a real detective. And then you need a detective. Mm -hmm. And the detective is going to be blue, of course. And the role of the detective is, is, is really played in a marvelous way. Yeah? There is a puzzle, and of course, all readers of your books are stepping into what is blue? What blue is going through? They all want to be the de the detective, and I think that's where your novel is really at the most extraordinary level possible. Because you indeed you manage to get the reader to be a detective. Was that what you were after? Oh, it absolutely was. Well, one of my primary influences when I was working with Blue's voice was Robert Browning's poem, My Last Duchess, the idea of this unreliable narrator. Well, you, at the beginning, you are very much in step with Blue, and eventually you as the reader become more active and start to question her perceptions and her views, and, uh, and you yourself become a sleuth, which is a reading experience I certainly enjoy myself. So if I deliver that, then it's nice to hear. And the unreliability of your character. Did you think of that right from the start? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Because with any first-person narrator, you're going to get a limited view of the world. And when you, as the reader, start divorcing yourself from that, it becomes really exciting. And, and that was also one of the challenges of this, because as the author, you have to have this godlike omniscience of what all the characters are doing in each chapter. And of course, with this restricted view of the world through blue, you as the author have to know what's happening off stage or, or off the screen in, in, to, in some ways. So um, that was part of the challenges, those, the authorial truth and blue's truth, and keeping those planes um, apart and, and intersecting at certain points as well. 
But wasn't it that wasn't it the most difficult part? It was. Me? I mean, it required me using Excel and, and mapping everything out in a very <laughs> nerdy way because uh, I didn't want to cheat. I, I, I think it would be obvious to a reader if I lost those threads. And I certainly am disappointed when I read books and, and, and think that the author lost those strands. And, uh, and so I wanted to deliver that. You delivered. You delivered. It, it, it was also called a postmodern novel. Do you think that is a good uh, characterization of your novel, postmodern? Well, I now that I've now that the book is out has been out in America at least for four months, I'm starting to realize books are as open to interpretation as abstract paintings. I mean, people really read so many different uh, things into the book, and I but I certainly didn't start out with the idea of writing a postmodern novel because I think novels that are written from ideas tend to have very shallow characterization and and. Uh, or they, or they tend to be about a larger truth where I'm more interested in character. And uh, that's what's bewitching to me as an as a author. So any sort of label like metafiction, though I'm not exactly sure what even that, <laughs> no one seems to you know what that is. You don't is. like to be called a postmodern novelist? No, I, certainly. I mean, it, because it does reference so many things, of course, the Western canon, and it's very much a product of particularly of all these books that Blue has read. So certainly I'll take postmodern. <laughs> I'll take it. It's not an offense. Any. I think it's a compliment. Right, right. <laughs> and one of the things which, well, which came to my mind is, gee, what a lot of ideas, what an energy you find in this book. What an enthusiasm. I mean, there is so much enthusiasm and energy in this book as, as you will find in 20 other books. Are you going to write 20 other books of this enthusiasm and with this energy? Oh, I hope so. I mean, for the, the writing experience for me is joyful. I mean, I've heard so many authors talk about that they don't like writing but love having written. And I'm, I think I'm the opposite. <laughs> I really love the day-to-day -day process of writing and submerging myself in this detailed world and creating characters from scratch, not writing autobiographically, but really making these people up and making them as real as possible. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really enjoy that writing and I, I, that process, and I think that comes across in that energy of what she speaks. Yeah. Yeah. I think you want to read several fragments yes. of your novel, yes. so we can all get a feel of, of these characters you just spoke about, and maybe then afterwards we can continue our conversation. Okay. Yeah? Sounds lovely. The first passage that I'll be reading is from the introduction. And uh, I don't think I need to set it up, except, well, I'll say that this takes place in the present, when Blue is a freshman at Harvard. And it becomes clear to the reader that she has a great weight on her shoulders, that she has something from her past that she's never before told to anyone. And this is causing a great deal of stress in her life. Um, so I will begin there. Introduction. Dad always said a person must have a magnificent reason for writing out his or her life story and expecting anyone to read it. Unless your name is something along the lines of Mozart, Matisse, Churchill, Che Guevara, or Bond, James Bond, you best spend your free time finger painting or playing shuffleboard for no one with the exception of your flabby-armed mother with stiff hair and a mashed potato way of looking at you, will want to hear the particulars of your pitiable existence, which doubtlessly will end as it began, with a wheeze. Given such rigid parameters, I always assumed I wouldn't have my magnificent reason until I was at least 70, with liver spots, rheumatism, wit as quick as a carving knife, a squat stucco house in Avignon, where I could be found eating 365 different cheeses. A lover 20 years my junior who worked in the fields. I don't know what kind of fields, any kind that were gold and frothy. And with any luck, a small triumph of science or philosophy to my name. And yet the decision, no, the grave necessity, to take pen to paper and write about my childhood, most critically, the year it unstitched like a snagged sweater, came much sooner than I ever imagined. It began with simple sleeplessness. 
It had been almost a year since I'd found Hannah dead, and I thought I'd managed to erase all traces of that night within myself, much in the way Henry Higgins, with his relentless elocution exercises, had scrubbed away Eliza's Cockney accent. I was wrong. By the end of January, I again found myself awake in the dead of night, the hall hushed, dark, spiky shadows crouching in the edges of the ceiling. I had nothing and no one to my name but a few fat, smug textbooks like Introduction to Astrophysics, and sad, silent James Dean gazing down at me where he was trapped in black and white and taped to the back of our door. I'd stare back at him through the smudge darkness and see, in microscopic detail, Hannah Schneider. She hung three feet above the ground by an orange electrical extension cord. Her tongue, bloated, the cheery pink of a kitchen sponge, slumped from her mouth. Her eyes looked like acorns or dull pennies or two black buttons off an overcoat kids might stick into the face of a snowman, and they saw nothing. Or else that was the problem, they'd seen everything. J.B. Tower wrote that the moment before death is seeing everything that has ever existed all at once. Though I wondered how he knew this as he was in the prime of life when he wrote Mortality. And her shoelaces, an entire treatise could be written on those shoelaces. They were crimson, symmetrical, tied in perfect double knots. Still, being an inveterate optimist, Van Meers are natural idealists and affirmative free thinkers, noted Dad. I hoped Lord Wakefulness might be a phase I'd quickly grow out of, a fad of some kind, like poodle skirts or having a pet rock. But then, one night early in February as I read the Aeneid, my roommate, Sue Jin, mentioned without looking up from her organic chemistry textbook that some of the freshmen on our hall were planning to crash an off-campus party at some doctor of philosophies. But I wasn't invited because I was considered more than a little bleak in demeanor. Especially in the morning when you're on your way to intro to 60s counterculture and the new left, she said, you look so, like, afflicted. It appeared, in spite of my concerted efforts to the contrary, I wore fuzzy sweaters in yellow and pink, fixed my hair into what I considered a very upbeat ponytail. I had started to twist into that very something I'd been afraid of ever since all of it had happened. I was becoming wooden and warped, mere rest stops on the highway to hopping mad. The kind of person who, in middle age, winced at children or deliberately raced into a dense flock of pigeons, minding their own business as they pecked at crumbs. Certainly I'd always felt chills tiptoeing down my spine when I came across an eerily resonant newspaper headline or advertisement. Steel magnate sudden death at 50, cardiac arrest, camping equipment liquidation sale. But I always told myself that everyone, at least everyone fascinating, had a few scars. My gradual descent into grimdom might have continued unabated had it not been for a certain startling phone call one cold March afternoon. It was almost a year to the day after Hannah died. You, said Su Jin, barely turning from diagram 2114 amino acids and peptides to hand me the phone. Hello? Hi, it's me, your past. I couldn't breathe. It was unmistakable, her low voice of sex and highways, equal parts Marilyn and Charles Corralt. But it had changed. If once it had been sugared and crackly, now it was porridge, grueled. Don't worry, Jade said. I'm not catching up with you. She laughed, a short ha laugh, like a foot kicking a rock. I no longer smoke, she announced, obviously quite proud of herself. And then she went on to explain that after St. Galway, she hadn't made it to college. Instead, due to her troubles, she'd voluntarily admitted herself to a Narnia kind of place where people talked about their feelings and learned to watercolor fruit. 
Jade hinted excitedly that a really huge rock star had been, residence, had been in residence on her floor, the comparatively well-adjusted third floor. Not as suicidal as the fourth or as manic as the second, she said, and they'd become close but to reveal his name would be to forsake everything she'd learned during her 10-month growth period at Heathridge Park. One of the parameters of her graduation, she explained, she used this word probably because it was preferable to release, was that she tie up loose ends. I was a loose end. So how are you, she asked. How's life, your dad? He's fantastic. And Harvard? Fine. Well, that brings me to the purpose of my call, an apology, which I will not dodge or do unconvincingly, she said officially, which made me sort of sad, because it sounded nothing at all like the real Jade. The Jade I knew as a rule always dodged apology, and if forced, did it unconvincingly. I'm sorry for the way I behaved. I know what happened had nothing to do with you. She just lost it, you know. People do that all the time, and they always have their own reasons. Please accept my request for forgiveness. I thought about interrupting her with my little cliffhanger, my about face, my kick in the teeth, my fine print. Actually, to be technical about the whole thing, um, but I couldn't do it. Not only did I not have the courage, I didn't see the point of telling her the truth. Not now. The rest of our call was a fervid exchange of, so give me your email and let's plan a big reunion. Paper doll pleasantness that did little to cover the fact we'd never see each other again and would rarely speak. I was aware, as ever, that she, and maybe the others too, would occasionally float over to me like pollen off a withered dandelion, with news of sugar plum marriages, gooey divorces, moves to Florida, a new job in real estate. But there was nothing keeping them, and they'd drift away as simply and randomly as they'd come. Thank you. That's the end of the first section. The next passage uh, I'm going to read is uh, Blue describing her father, Gareth, the political science professor. <coughs> Dad picked up women the way certain wool pants can't help but pick up lint. For years, I had a nickname for them, though I feel a, a little guilty using it now. June bugs. See Fig Eater Beetle, Ordinary Insects, Volume 24. There was Mona Latrofsky, the actress from Chicago, with wide-set eyes and dark hair on her arms, who liked to shout, Gareth, you're a fool, with her back to him. Dad's cue to run over to her, turn her around, and see the look of bitter longing on her face. Only Dad never turned her around to see the bitter longing. Instead, he stared at her back as if it was an abstract painting. Then he went into the kitchen for a glass of bourbon. There was Connie Madison Parker, whose perfume hung in the air like a battered piñata. There was Zula Pierce of Okush, New Mexico, a black woman who was taller than he was. So whenever Dad kissed her, she had to bend down as if peeking through a peephole to see who was ringing her bell. She started out calling me Blue Honey, which, like her relationship with Dad, slowly began to erode, becoming Blue Honey and then Blue Oni, ultimately ending with Baloney. <laughs> Baloney had it in for me from the very beginning, she always screamed. Dad's romances could last anywhere between a platypus egg incubation, 19 to 21 days, and a squirrel pregnancy, 24 to 45 days. I admit sometimes I hated them, especially the ones teeming with ladies' tips, how-tos, and ways to improve. The ones like Connie, Connie Madison Parker, who muscled her way into my bathroom and chastised me for hiding my merchandise. Connie Madison Parker, age 36, on merchandise. You got to put your goods on display, babe. Otherwise, not only will the boys ignore you, and trust me on this, my sister's flat as you. We're talking the Great Plains of East Texas, no landmarks. One day you'll look down and have no wares at all. What'll you do then? Sometimes June bugs weren't too terrible. Some of the sweeter, more docile ones, like 
poor droopy-eyed Tally Meyerson, I actually felt sorry for. Because even though Dad made no attempt to hide the fact they were as temporary as scotch tape, most were blind to his indifference. Perhaps the June bug understood Dad had felt that way about all the others. But armed with three decades' worth of ladies' home journal editorials, an expertise in such publications as getting him to the altar and the chill factor, how not to give a damn and leave him wanting more, as well as her own personal history of soured relationships. Most of them believed, with the sort of unyielding insistence associated with religious fanatics, that when under the spell of her burnt sugar aura, Dad wouldn't feel that way about her, Within a few fun-filled dates, Dad would learn how intoxicating she was in the kitchen, what an old sport she was in the bedroom, how enjoyable during carpools. And so it always came as a complete surprise when Dad turned out the lights, swatted her ruthlessly off his screen, and subsequently drenched his entire porch in raid pest control. Thank you. And the last section I'm going to read is um, our, our Blue's first encounter with Hannah Schneider, who, of course, is the woman that she's envisioning in the introduction hanging. It's her death that haunts her in the beginning of the novel. We were in the frozen section of Fat Cat Foods when I first saw Hannah Schneider, two days after our arrival in Stockton. I was standing by our shopping cart, waiting for Dad to choose which flavor of ice cream he preferred. America's greatest revelation was not the atom bomb, he was saying, not fundamentalism, not fat farms, not Elvis, not even the quite astute observation that gentlemen prefer blondes, but the great heights to which she has propelled ice cream. Dad was fond of commenting this while standing with the freezer door open and inspecting every flavor of Ben and Jerry's, oblivious to the customers swarming around him, waiting for him to move. As he scrutinized the cartons on the shelves, however, I became aware of a woman standing at the far end of the aisle. She was dark-haired, thin as a riding crop. Dressed in funeral attire, a black suit with black 1980s stilettos, more dagger than shoe. She looked incongruous, bleached in the neon lights and achy tunes of fat cat foods. It was obvious, however, in the way she examined the back of a box of frozen peas, that she liked being incongruous. The lone bombshell slinking into a Norman Rockwell. The ostrich amongst buffalo. She exuded that mix of satisfaction and self-consciousness of beautiful women used to being looked at, which made me sort of hate her. I'd long decided to hold in contempt all people who believed themselves to be the subject of everyone else's establishing shot, boom shot, reaction shot, close up, or choker. Probably because I couldn't imagine myself turning up on anyone's storyboard, not even my own. At the same time, I, and the man staring at her with his mouth in a no, holding a lean cuisine, couldn't help but shout, quiet on the set, and roll em because even at this distance, she was unbelievably stunning and strange. She returned the peas to the freezer and began to walk toward us. New York super fudge or fish food, asked Dad. Her heels stabbed the floor. I didn't want to stare, so I made an unconvincing attempt to examine the nutritional content of various popsicles. As she passed, she glanced at Dad, gazing into the freezer. When she looked at me, she smiled. She had an elegant, sort of romantic, bone-sculpted face, one that took well to both shadows and light, even at their extremes. And she was older than I'd realized, somewhere in her late 30s. Most extraordinary, though, was the air of a Chateau Marmont bungalow about her, a sense of RKO, which I'd never before witnessed in person, only while Dad and I watched Jezebel into the early hours of the morning. Yes, within her carriage and deliberate steps like a metronome, now retreating behind the display of potato chips, was a little bit of the Paramount lot, a little neat scotch and air kisses at Ciro's. 
I felt when she opened her mouth, she wouldn't utter the crumbly speech of modernity, but would use moist words like bow, top drawer, and sound, only occasionally ring-a-ding-ding. And when she considered a person, took in him or her, she would place those nearly extinct personality traits, character, reputation, and class above all others. Not that she wasn't real. She was. There were hairs out of place, a quiver of white lint on her skirt. I simply felt somewhere, at some time, she'd been the toast of something. And a confident, even aggressive look in her eyes made me certain she was planning a comeback. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marisha. I think we could all continue to listen to you for the rest of the evening without oh, any you. problem. <laughs> thank you. Usually, my experience is that at the, st at the beginning, at the start of a novel, there is a, an image. Is there such an image for you which started your novel? Absolutely. I, um, I began, as I said before, with character, and almost immediately, when I had these, these two people that I didn't know much about, I, I was struck by the image of the final 20 pages of the book, what precisely their relationship would be. And I knew that coming up with the plot, the arc of the story would lead me to that, that final moment and that final dynamic between them. So at the beginning was this image? Yes, yes. Before I knew anything, I, before I had any crux of a story or if I knew that there was going to be a murder or death or anything to that extent, it was that final, that final image. And where did it come from? It's a mystery to me. <laughs> People have asked me this so much, I almost feel like I should make up some incredible story. But no, it was just one of those extraordinary You woke moments. up and then it was there. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, I had just gotten my job as a financial consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And... I was probably sitting under the fluorescent lights in my tiny cubicle, which my coworkers called a veal fattening pen, and I realized I had to get myself out of this, so I'm sure <laughs> my mind began to wander, and it was really in those first few weeks of working there that I came up with uh, those two characters. Oh, wow. Then there is this other question you must have answered about a thousand times, but I really have to ask you that, that is about not only the, the fact that you gave the book the form of a course syllabus with all these titles of uh, big novels, big literary works, Othello, A Portrait of the Artress as a Young Man, Wuthering Heights, The House of the Seven Gables, there's a lot of French titles as well, I'm very, very pleased. The Liaison Dangereuse, Madame Bonvary. Mm -hmm. I think there are two ways of regarding these. I've read people who said, oh, how awful, how pretentious, what an uh, uh, awful debut is this, because look how she is showing off. And the others say, no, there's more about it. I'm mm. more or less the second part. But could you still explain me why you chose to, of course. to well, the give these names to the, to the chapters? Well, the, the structure really was an offshoot of Blue's character. I mean, this is her story. And I knew, and it was actually probably after the third draft of the novel that I wanted to come up with a way that would make sense of how Blue would organize her story. I mean, unlike me, who doesn't mind chaos, she loves clear and unambiguous labeling. And so the way that she would structure her story would have to follow that. And uh, I was also interested as a writer in how the books we read, whether it's uh, part of the Western canon or even pulp fiction, how they, if they're life-changing, stop belonging to the author and, and stop becoming about plot or even character, but they become personal experiences. For example, when I first read To Kill a Mockingbird, I was uh, visiting my uncle in Venezuela, and it was one of these extraordinary summers. And uh, I remember reading that book on the boat and forgetting to put sunscreen, so I had this r horrible sun uh, sunburn, and I was red for weeks, but I didn't care because I was reading this incredible book. And, uh, and along those same lines, when I hear that title, it, it becomes less about Scout or Boo Radley, but more about that incredible summer that I had. And in, in along those same lines, each chapter title 
is uh, part of Blue's life, and it's really informed by the mysteries within each chapter. And they take on new and hopefully humorous connotations yeah. based on, on each of these uh, wild events. So you read really, you read all these titles? Well, I was an English literature major, so I was always reading. And I had a very bookish But as I said, there's a lot of French, there's German, there's, I mean, yes. there's, the world literature is there. And I also think I take a more populist view with these so-called classics. I don't think that they're books to be intimidated by. I don't think that they should be put high up on a shelf waiting to be taken down by a PhD or doctoral candidate. I think Shakespeare and Dickens wrote for the populace. They wrote to entertain, and I don't think that I certainly don't think that we should necessarily be intimidated by them. Of course, not everyone has time to read like Blue, so <laughs> I mean, all of us have one or two books that. There's change. not only the construction of the book, the chapters which have the names of literary works. There is also a very high number of citations. It's sometimes like uh, Blue is writing uh, a scientific article because. It's the name, there are references, a lot of references between brackets. The name of the book, the author, the year, uh, the, the publishing house. Uh, sometimes it's completely uh, made up, of course. I don't right. think well, most everything of them is are made up, right? probably. But yeah. still, I mean, why did you do this? Well, as an author. Because, well, originally it was again, from character, the idea that Blue interprets the world through these books, and particularly at the outset of the novel. I mean, the references purposely thin over the course of the book as she learns to be more experiential, to experience life rather than simply reading about it. But it's also a conceit mentioned in the introduction, which her father, of course, tells her that when we're presenting any sort of topic or, or point of view, everything should be relentlessly annotated. Otherwise, someone will inevitably raise their hand and tell you that you've gotten it all wrong. So in this case, Blue is taking her father's advice quite literally, which leads you to the question, when you reach the end of the novel, how much has she really broken away from him? And, and their relationship is quite complex, so that sheds light on, yeah. on the nature of her following her father's advice verbatim. But as a reader, it's sometimes interrupting the flow of the story. Did you realize that while you were writing? I did. I mean, I purposely, th with this sort of book, because there's an unreliable narrator and I wanted yeah. the reader to begin to want to solve or to want to be more active in the reading as well. So I knew that that was going to be um, for someone looking for a very quick read. I mean, perhaps you can just skip over those references. Yes, you can skip everything, <laughs> but that's not the purpose of reading. Of course. So, uh, But I did. I wanted to slow the reader down because I do, I was just reading um, Harold Bloom's book about how to read and why, yeah. and he talks about the difficult pleasures of reading, that when we re read a book that is a bit more challenging, the, the payoff is greater, and I really hope to deliver that in this book. Okay, and so you created obstacles for the reader. Well, hopefully they're fun obstacles. <laughs> yes, yes, they are. But still, yeah. what what is the reason you read? Not well, quote Harold Bloom, just quote Marie Chappes. Oh well, because well, I, there's reading and writing, and I almost think I prefer the reading. I mean, I'm, I had a very bookish childhood. I spent my much of it reading, and so that was just always. Uh, a, I love that reading experience, the engrossing uh, feeling of losing yourself in a, in a detailed world with complex characters. And, and, uh, and, and, yes, it's and the feeling entering, of losing yourself. Yes, and entering a world and meeting people who you'd never meet in actuality. And, and mm. that's the joy of reading. Mm. It's not uh, a way of uh, being elsewhere. It's not a way of being other persons. Of course. Yeah. When you enter those worlds, you become yeah. something beyond yourself. Yeah. What is the most fascinating book you have ever read? Which book changed your life? Oh, it would have to be Lolita. When I read it in college, I mean, I think Why? I... Why? Tell me. Well, tell I picked it up yeah. initially. Um, of course, it has this, this notorious reputation, so it was always a book that was off limits to me for whatever reason. Yeah, well, we know. want to hear your version, not anybody else's. Why did Lolita change your life? Well, originally I picked it up, and uh, as a, a young person, and how uh, old and where? I was probably. <laughs> this is like the Inquisition. Uh, well, it's only you starting now. <laughs> I picked it up probably in middle school, and I was, of course, reading for these notoriously racy parts, and of course I never found them, so I, I put it aside. And then I came across it again in uh, American literature class, 
You were? How old? I was probably um, 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you it picked just, it up again. Yes. You had this it was nasty to memory. Me, so I had to. You had to. <laughs> had to okay, you had to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, but around the same time where I was discovering in this uh, for the second time, I also auditioned for the play, Ed Edward Albee's adaptation, which Nabokov actually hated. Yeah. And uh, I, was, I didn't get Lolita. I played this, um, this doll character. <laughs> But so, so everything in my life for two months was Lolita. I was going to rehearsal, it was Lolita, it was school, Lolita, and, and then just reading it for myself, I just found, I mean, not only is the, the, the story itself, I mean, it's an intellectual mystery, and, uh, and the reader's also forced to take a more active role in the reading, and yet you yeah. don't have to. You can simply read through it for the story and the language too. So it just oh, uh, it's a very technique answer you are giving me here. Very I, celebrated. I mean, it's all thinking answer. What did you feel when you were reading it? Oh. Why did it change your life? Well, it was just glorious, and it just went to a place that. Uh, well, of course, I mean, on the, the sentence by sentence level, I mean, you can just pause on and, and read one sentence again and again, and it yeah. is moving and. I mean, there's such sadness to it. Yeah. Um. You know, it's a writer's writer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A lot of writers love him. Mm -hmm. I've always asked myself why. I don't know. And I actually don't he like hearing about other writers like him. I feel very possessive of him. <laughs> okay. You're like the only uncle. one, Marisha. Yeah. You're the only one. <laughs> no. You have said about Blue that um, she filters every life experience she has through books. So every life experience she has is an At the experience outset through of the book. books. Yes. Yeah. What does that do to one, to a person? Well, you tend not to be very experiential. You can't do anything without, without thinking of, uh, of something else. I mean, blue yeah. is more of the extreme, but I think that's something yeah. that we all do uh, to some extent. I mean, it, living yeah. in New York as a single person, so many women, just ref they constantly judge their own lives by Sarah Jessica Parker and Sex in the City. It's almost, yeah. we, can't, we can't divorce ourselves from that experience and simply live sometimes. And, and of course, this is something I was exploring in this book. Yeah, yeah. Do you, in a certain way, feel like Blue? I mean, how is your relationship to Blue? I, th I, I have more of a... I think my acting background comes into play when I'm writing from a particular character, because Blue is not me. I mean, she's quite different yeah. than... Uh, yeah. I mean, her persona is different than mine, and I simply feel when I'm writing from her point of view, I'm. And also when I'm writing any of the characters, whether it's Gareth or Eva Brewster or any of the June Bugs or, or even Zach or any yeah. um, of the high school students, it's simply diminishing or augmenting certain aspects of yourself. It's really a, a sort of acting exercise to some extent. What did you act in? What, if you say acting experience, what are you talking about? Maybe people don't know. Oh, well, I, uh, I took a lot of acting classes uh, while I was in um, university. Uh, for a while, I thought I was going to be an actress. And uh, so I acted in a variety of small off, off, off. Broadway, off, off, <laughs> off Broadway plays, uh, some of which uh, closed after two performances, and um, which was always the l like tiny little tragedies because you work so hard with a group of people and you really believe in what you're doing, and then to have it close it was just the ultimate yeah. sadness. So, but so you didn't become an actress, a real one, a big one, but no. you became a writer. Mm -hmm. There must be some link between those two. Could you try to phrase that? How does it work? Well, what I said before, when you're writing from a particular point of view, I mean, you have to know everything about your character. You have to know everything about Blue and how her, her points of view, how she would react, her emotions, what really sets her off, what would anger her. You have to know all that, which is something that is part of an actor's preparation. Do you still act? I haven't. No, I haven't no. recently. But if anyone's casting, I'm here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And it's not only you write, you act, but you also play the harp. You have created a wonderful website yourself. And you have made the illustrations, the visual aids of your book yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us how you made these illustrations? Because I think they did not exist right from the start. 
in your book. Exactly. I had, uh, when Blue was referencing visual aids one, two, it was up to the reader to conjure that. Because I, I love the non-visual aspects of a book. Because, of course, when you're reading, you use your own imagination and you see these characters. So I didn't want to necessarily have a visual that would intrude upon that. So yeah. I initially resisted yeah. it. But my agent, who's much more... <laughs> straightforward said it says see visual aid why aren't they in there and I of course had some cerebral answer and she said this just doesn't work so uh, she knew that I had done a lot of drawing in my free time because I have some of my artwork in, around my apartment and she'd seen those those works so she uh, suggested that I put together some 12 drawings drawing from Blue's point of view um, so in, in a sense that they would be her characterization and did and you also like those drawings I think they, I think they were marvelous oh, because you. they're not photos, but they're just giving an idea of the mm -hmm, characters. Mm -hmm. The character is mm -hmm. in your drawing. Mm -hmm. Did you work on those for a long time? I actually did them in the span of one week because we were going to out with the manuscript to sell it. So I was up one all week? night. One week, all mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know I didn't sleep, and actually that was around New Year's, and I didn't even go out for New Year's. So I was, <laughs> it was horrible, but um, I just wanted to get them finished and. And they have a sort of late night quality to them, I think. You can tell the sleepless nights from all the dots. <laughs> Speaking about the, the drawings which you did in one week, how many years did you spend on writing this book? This book was probably three and a half years. Three mm -hmm. and a half years, mm -hmm. full time writer. No, no, half of that was when I was working at PricewaterhouseCoopers. <laughs> And then I was able to um, eventually quit my job when my husband and I, he, though he wasn't my husband at the time, um, we moved to London. And I was able to write full time for the first time. So four years, half of those years full time. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Did you sleep? Um, I did, but I didn't have much of a social life for like two years. <laughs> no, not that. Um, but of course, I just knew that I, this was my dream. I really wanted to be able to quit my job eventually. And uh, in New York, I mean, it's very common for people to have their full-time job and then their night. It's a little Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the idea that you have this other dream that you're working away on. And uh, you mean, a lot of waiters or actresses and, and people temp when they're working on screenplays or filmmakers. So that's very common actually in New York. So you're not an exception in that uh, case? No. I mean, I mean, everybody is like that in New York. Well, everyone has, <laughs> well, not everyone. But. <laughs> well, speaking about this period, these years during which you worked on the novel, the, the construction of the book is supported by the chapters, which are very clear, but I imagine that you must have had a huge scheme in your head or maybe on paper how did you work to get all these threads together at the end did you all have them in your head did you make drawings did you <coughs> make how did you work I used, uh, I mapped everything out beforehand, and I used, because I was working as a consultant, I was working on Excel anyway. And if I used Excel. You made Excel I things of, of yes. your novel. Yes. Not only for the events of each chapter, but keeping all those strands straight, absolutely, I had to organize it. I mean, I had written two novels while I was in college, and I made the mistake of not planning anything out uh, beforehand, and I ended up writing myself into a hole. Just structurally, it didn't hang together correctly, and I wasn't going to do that again. So I knew that I had to have some sort of road map, and particularly with this elaborate mystery, you have to absolutely know what's happening. Yeah. Um, beyond what the narrator's reporting. And you st you sticked to what you thought of in the beginning, or did you change a lot of things? Oh, everything underway? was there from the very beginning. Though, of course, I mean, you do, I mean, if you have point A, point B, point C, sometimes you realize you don't need your point B, and you're constantly editing and, and changing in that way. But the core of the mystery was always the same. And you didn't change a bit? You didn't think, oh, this character goes that way, well, in the beginning, I had planned him or her to go that way. For Not the at main all. characters, no, their stories were already there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> it's just like a day's work for you then. You start at nine, you quit at five, and you just have a good days of consultancy, but then for your novel. Mm -hmm. um, well, I yeah? wrote while I was at Pricewaterhouse, too. Yeah, but so. not all the time. No, not all the time. No. A lot, though. <laughs> 
The, um, the website, you di designed it yourself as well? Yes. Did you notice? Did you s have a look at the website? It's a marvelous website. It's all in movement and it's, you can open things, close it. There's a very, well, it's, it's amazing. Have a look at it. What's your website again? Marisha Pestle Point. Uh, what? Well, or? there's all NL. NL, is the, okay. Is the dot. Did you work on that yourself? The American, yes, I did all the drawings and conceptualized it, but I didn't do the flash animation. Any of the computer programming I didn't do because I, I don't know how to do that. So, um, But I did all the illustrations. Wow. This gr group of friends, you just read a few fragments from, from your book, mm -hmm. uh, one of which is uh, you have a very nice intonation of being jade, for instance. These group of friends, um, did you experience such a group of friends with such intense and at the same time strange relationships between them? Certainly. I mean, in my own high school, but never to the extent that I was part of a particular clique, no. I, I tended to be... I, well, I, I personally moved between groups. I was always... I always felt like an outsider, and yet, unlike Blue, I was able to at least pretend I was inside, so... Um, but no, I, I didn't the have that The whole atmosphere of, of jealousy, of friendship, of something mm -hmm. which goes beyond. Mm -hmm. Where did you find that element? Oh, well, by observation. And uh, I mean, I was interested in writing about adolescent relationships because everything is so, emotions are so palpable during that time in your life and, and everything seems so monumental. So things just tend to explode. It's almost, um, it's easier to get a rise out of a teenager because things are so emotional. And uh, so that was just an interesting time and an interesting age for me to write about. Yeah. And the relationship between the group and this teacher, which is a very special one mm -hmm. as well. Did you observe that as well? Yes, I, I, I tend for characters to be more inspired by strangers. I mean, people I watch, not necessarily my own experience. I mean, I didn't have a Hannah Schneider in my, in my life, but. I'm more inspired by someone I happen to watch in a waiting room or uh, someone walking by when I'm riding a bus or oh, that sort of uh, stranger because then I can make up their histories mm. and make them larger than life or as um, banal as, uh, as I want to. But I can, I, I can fill that empty vessel, which is what's exciting to me as a writer. Mm. So with Hannah Schneider, I always find it interesting when an adult befriends a, a group of students and, and hangs out <laughs> or spends leisure time with yeah. uh, with people so much younger than than herself in Hannah's case. So I, yeah. I found that interesting. And yeah. and there's the question as to why. And that, that was just something I was exploring. Hannah Schneider is probably the most mysterious character of, of your book. Without saying anything about the end, because probably a lot of people are still... Um, going to live through that magnificent uh, end, you linked her to a part in history um, which influenced her, her life, but also mm -hmm. Gareth's lives mm -hmm. and Blue's life. How did you find that period? Did you have to link the end of your book to history, to our days, to our recent history? Well, without giving away the ending. Yeah, that's the difficulty. <laughs> um, no, it's OK. Uh, I knew, well, based on what I said before, when I had that initial vision of Blue and Gareth and what their final relationship would be, I knew that there had to be an extraordinary reason as to why. Yeah. And I did a great deal of research um, of 60s and 70s radicalism, the weather underground, the Symbionese um, Symbionese Liber Liberation yeah. Army, yeah. Um, and, and the Black Panthers. and. Just it was an extraordinary time period, especially when you must have done a lot with, of research, didn't you? Yes, I mean especially with the personal accounts because we tend to glamorize the Che Guevara radical, uh, revolutionary character standing for freedom, but then there's the human element around that, how human yeah. relationships and families suffer. So I did do a lot of research, but primarily. Um, the human aspect and how Bill Ayers or other members of the under, of Weather Underground, how they live now, how their families have been affected. And, uh, and that was just interesting to me because yeah. we do tend to um, 
glamorize and put Che Guevara on t-shirts and, and herald him, but then there's the violence and uh, the fallout from, from uh, adhering to some sort of dogma that is, uh, is and there. In a certain and way, you showed how it can work out. Mm -hmm. Well, let's mm -hmm. not develop it further. I will give you the floor in, in, in maybe just one question from my side. Um, are you already conscious of fitting into a literary tradition or not at all? Are you just being a writer? Or are you conscious of being this new, talented, American, young writing tradition? No. no? I, I think, uh, I do think there's an incredible group of, of young authors that I'm personally excited about from a reader's point of view, but um, I don't, I think we're all trying to work out our own stories, and I certainly don't think, I like to just ground myself in the story and the characters that I'm yeah. passionate about at the time, and simply be a storyteller and leave it at that. Really. Well, you're a great storyteller. Oh, yeah, thank yeah. you. May I give the floor to you now? Maybe there are some questions you would like to ask, to put forward now. You have the chance, she's here now. Not the first question then maybe, yes? very rich in metaphors and quotations. I wonder where did you get the inspiration from? How did the writing process go? The style really came from Blue's character, from her characterization. I mean, I, the other books that I wrote um, in college have quite a different voice, but this particular style came from Blue's love of language, and it was almost there from the very beginning. I didn't, a lot of people have asked me, do I write a rough draft and then go back and put the metaphors in it, and not at all. I work in a very, at a very slow pace, and uh, I work on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence level, and uh, usually at the outset of my writing day, I revise what I wrote the previous day, so I, I tend to polish as I go along, but that particular style came from the way Blue is going to tell her story. But how did you come up with it? I mean, did you think of it just I sat think down the, and started writing. Or? Well, I write visually. I see it in my own mind, and it's just a question of how Blue is going to relate that on the page, if that's what you're asking. And that, how do I come up with it? I just that's that's the the creative question as to uh, as to how writers actually write. I mean, it's just simply a it's a mental thing trying to see it in your mind's eye and then portray it on the page in a way that would fit the character really. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I read your book, and I'm sorry to uh, say this in past tense, because I wish I was still reading it, because it was just amazing. Uh, but I think that um, the most amazing thing was that the whole, the entire book reminded me of Lolita, uh, of Nabokov, because that's the first book I bought after reading yours. Oh. Uh, and I, I did read it when I was 14, because my parents uh, slipped it to me. So, uh, <laughs> so and, and, and it really reminded me of it. So did you, mm. do you think you, really, you were really influenced by his writing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think every writer has a book that haunts them. And I, I think for s some unknown reason, that was Lolita, particularly at the, while I was writing special topics. Yeah. And then just some of the themes of, of being in exile. I mean, in some blue, in ways, Blue is such an outsider. She sees it. And the idea of childhood and obsession, some of those themes uh, influence, influence me. And then, of course, the love of wordplay that Nabokov uh, has in Lolita. I, I share his love of language. Yeah. And, but it's certainly, I mean, it's an influence, but I think with the great masters and the great books, you, as a writer, you certainly aren't thinking about those while you're writing. You put those aside. But and you are inspired. Exactly, they them. inspire yeah. you, but you certainly are over yeah. here in the corner doing your own little thing. So. Um, but I don't know if for subsequent novels it will have that, those same reverberations of, of Lolita. I, I seriously doubt it, because I'm now working on a, a different world and a different yeah. set of characters, but no, absolutely. But so it, it was uh, funny to me that you, uh, because I was thinking about Lolita, and that you mentioned that it was your, uh, your favorite book, so yeah, yeah. it's funny. <laughs> and uh, the first sentences of uh, Lolita's, uh, uh, Nabokov's Lolita, um, 
I, I can't remember them right now, but I kept ha um, having them in my head while reading your book. It's I, I think it's a, like love of my life, fruit of fire my, of my loins, yeah. fire of my loins, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I think you you've been inspired by him, but I think you did write your own history, I guess, Thank with you. this book. So yeah, Thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Oh, I'm working on my second novel, and uh, I can't talk about it because I tend to hoard my writing, so I can't give you anything else. But I am working on it, and uh, hopefully it won't take me three years, but <laughs> I'm not making any promises. I tend to write very slowly, so. Anything I have else? some questions, but... Uh, there's a lot of talk, but I'm not allowed to talk specifically as to what's happening, but uh, there is a great deal of interest, so hopefully, hopefully I can be involved in the casting because I don't want Julia Roberts as Hannah Schneider. <laughs> 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 but they tend to keep writers at, a, at an arm's length, so, but I'll try to put that in the contract. I don't know if that's going to happen. There was a lot, a lot of fuss about, a lot of hype about your novel even before it came out. Uh, it, was, it was a big advance and Nabokovian in scope and style. It was said Hitchcockian and Donna Tartish narrative, Jonathan Franzen and Laurie Moore type metaphors before anybody could read one sentence of you. What did it do to you? Before even your book was published, you were being characterized like that? Oh, uh, of course, I mean, that, that sort of level of hype, you, as an author, you don't, you're not even sure if they're even talking about what you wrote, so you sort of read it and, and question it. I mean, of course, it, it's great to have a certain excitement as to what yeah. uh, you do. I mean, that's nice, but of course, um, there's a downside to that, particularly in America, because we tend to hype things, and then the book itself doesn't deliver, so... Um, I was just relieved when people did respond to it in a positive way because yeah. uh, uh, the hollow hype is never good. So, yeah. And if there is no more question, I will just have to ask my final question. Mm -hmm. You said in an interview, you said, I'm not so interested in my own experience. I want what I write to be larger than life. That's quite mm. ambitious, isn't it? Mm. Well, I think I was probably responding to the idea that a first novel needs is almost always autobiographical because yeah. you're told, at least in American creative writing programs, that you have to write what you know. And uh, with that sort of sen that sort of life sentence yeah. is incredibly uh, off-putting to me because I want to learn, I want to begin to write what I don't know and then come to know it as I'm writing it and yeah. know a detailed world that I'm inventing. I simply don't want to put real life onto the page because, first of all, I, well, I adhere to Gareth's dictum that you need to write your own life story, you have to have a magnificent reason, and I certainly don't have mine yet, so I won't bore anyone with my memoir. <laughs> so that's, that's well, really Please nice. continue writing, yeah. and we're all looking forward already to your second novel. Oh, thank you thank so much. Thank you very much. much for being here. Thank you all. It was lovely being here. Thank you, Mrs. Pessel, for your talk and reading. And thank you very much, uh, Margot, for the interview. Very well done. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Embo Entos Publishers for their cooperation. I would like to thank Odeon as well. And of course, I would like to thank my staff, Kobe Evans, and all our volunteers who are here tonight. For now, I would like to let you know that we have planned the following lectures. Tomorrow we will have a lecture in The Hague with Tony Judd, and he will discuss his book with Fritz Bolkestein in the Museum in The Hague at 8 o'clock. And on the 12th of December, we will have Harold McGee on food and cooking. To keep yourself informed about our lectures, please have a look at our website, www.john-adams.nl. And if you would like to become a member, we would be very pleased. And please come to me tonight or also have a look at our website. Uh, because we would really be delighted if you would become a member and support us in that way. 
Um, Mrs. Pessel will s be signing her book here right on stage, and you can get her book over there at the bookseller uh, Atheneum. And uh, please, maybe you can queue at this side of the stage. She will also do a book signing tomorrow in Scheltema at four o'clock. Um, and if you would like to have a drink, you can have a drink over there at the bar. For now, I would like to thank you for coming here and I hope to welcome you at one of our upcoming lectures. Bye-bye. <laughs>